Before I begin, I'll talk about two things. One, a little bit about breast pathology at the Cleveland Clinic, and then second, I'll talk a little bit about the topics I chose for this week. Um, so breast pathology at the Cleveland Clinic is large. Um, it's over 10,000 surgical specimens. We do over 5,000 biomarkers, and we're approaching about 1,000 uh, outside consults. So we're very busy, as uh, Dr. Goldblum mentioned. We have 11 going on 12 breast pathologists. Lots of people do two things, but some of us are just completely subspecialized. Um, it's a great practice. They have um, great, uh, we have great diagnosticians, so if you ever want to send a case in, we'd be happy to look at it. Uh, the topics I chose for this week, so I'm going to go through kind of an algorithmic approach to get something you're not used to getting. Um, that way you can start the work up and have at least a differential diagnosis. And they're all fit into these buckets that I outline. Um, I'm going to talk about HER2 because that all of a sudden became very, very important. And then uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, recurrence metastases. So, um, you know, what's the difference? What we'll talk about today is routine versus difficult types of cases. We'll provide you with a framework and an algorithmic approach to identifying and working up challenging biopsies. We'll go through some unknown cases and we'll provide suggestions on uh, reporting. So on the left is what I would say is more of a routine case where you have your UDH, your ADH, DCIS, LCIS. And on the right are kind of the different buckets that we get on consults, which are spindle cell lesions, papillary lesions, fibroepithelial lesions, and other rare lesions, which include these uh, salivary gland type tumors. So our first case is a 65-year-old woman. She has a palpable mass. It looks benign on radiology, but they recommend an ultrasound guided core. So here's the core biopsy at low power on the left, higher to medium power on the right. Um, what you can note from here is that there's really no benign breast tissue. There does appear to be entrapped mammary adipose tissue. There is scattered um, inflammation uh, and uh, um, has kind of a whirling pattern. When you go on closer magnification, you can see that there, the atypia is low to uh, medium grade, there's some hyperchromasia, but there definitely seems to be uh, an inflammatory uh, infiltrate component to this tumor. And here you just see additional uh, uh, slides of uh, kind of the overall spindled architecture and entrapped uh, fat. And then here, again, on higher power, you can see the nuclear atypia is not, it, it wouldn't call it striking, it's, it's more moderate to mild. So. What do we do when we have a spindle cell lesion? Well, I always say the first three things you do is you make sure it's not metaplastic carcinoma, you make sure it's not metaplastic. Uh, gonna continue my discussion today talking about my absolute favorite organ, the, the pancreas, talking about uh, both inflammatory conditions as well as some, um, some neoplastic mimics of inflammatory conditions today. And first, I'd like to start with a case presentation. Pretty typical case. This is a 43-year-old man, new onset diabetes. He presented to an outside hospital with uh, new complaints of a, a severe abdominal pain as well as vomiting. He was noted to be pretty jaundiced in the ED. Uh, lab showed an elevated alkaline phosphatase as well as elevated LFTs, including a markedly elevated uh, total bilirubin and direct bilirubin. He had an ultrasound performed uh, at bedside in the ED, showed a dilated common bile duct, and he had some uh, follow-up MRI uh, while admitted, and it demonstrated a 3.8 centimeter pancreatic head uh, mass with uh, narrowing of the distal common bile duct as well as the pancreatic duct. So very concerning uh, clinical and imaging findings. And this was the MRI from the case. Uh, you can notice here that the pancreatic duct as well as the common bile duct, uh, cut off abruptly in this kind of uh, low, low attenuation mass in the center of the field. So very, very concerning from an imaging standpoint, only getting more concerning. They did an ERCP uh, and some brushings of the common bile duct were taken at the same time. Uh, along with an FNA of the mass. Uh, the final cytopathology only showed uh, necros extensive necrosis and rare atypical cells throughout, uh, but it was not diagnostic for, for adenocarcinoma. Uh, he was referred to, to the clinic uh, for surgical evaluation given the, the concerning clinical and, and radiographic features of the mass, and uh, additional labs were performed at the time 
He had a completely normal CA199, uh, uh, no elevations in IgG4, uh, no elevations in chromogran or any other neuroendocrine markers. Uh, because this was kind of atypical, he had repeat cross-sectional imaging performed and again demonstrated the, redemonstrated the presence of the pancreatic mass, but um, no, no vascular involvement. Uh, it was discussed extensively at the multidisciplinary tumor board and ultimately the board's decision was to recommend the patient for surgical resection. And that's what happened. Here's the Whipple resection that we received in surgical pathology. Um, bisected here through the, the, both the common bile duct or the intra, intrapancreatic portion of the common bile duct at least and the pancreatic duct. Uh, and you could see that the bile duct was, was pro-patent from uh, where it was transected into the uh, duodenum. Um, pancreatic duct, not so much, a little bit uh, obstructed by this, by this fibrotic mass involving the whole pancreatic head. There wasn't really a discrete mass though. And today, uh, the topic is the third most common consult that we see. First being Barrett's, second being cancer's uh, question of invasion and polyps, third being some aspect of colitis, usually IBD, question of dysplasia. Um, so that's what I'm gonna talk about. And I'm only gonna hit on, you can talk about IBD and go in all sorts of directions, but I'm really gonna focus on a couple of key points, really two main ones that, that, that we'll talk about. And these are the ones that I think we see the most in, as a consult and that we deal with in our own practice. So take a look at this resection specimen. We see a lot of these, a big IBD center in Cleveland. So tell me, anybody want to tell me what they think this is based upon the distribution of injury? You see, okay. Um, not a trick question, that, that is correct. Uh, this is, and, and we, I assume you think it's UC because everything looks involved from the distal margin of resection, which is the rectum, con and continues proximally in a contiguous fashion all the way. It looks like there's a pretty sharp cutoff right here between what's normal and abnormal. And it is UC. And, you know, when you take sections from here every five or ten centimeters, these are all going to show evidence of a chronic colitis, probably active, but some areas were probably quiescent. If you take by, uh, sections from this junction of normal and abnormal, all I can tell you, and if I don't say this point later, I'll say it now, you can see some patchiness at the advancing edge of ulcerative colitis. So don't let that, you know, alter your viewpoint that, oh, maybe this is Crohn's. So expect some patchiness right at that junction, but you should expect that all the sections from here are normal, and they were. And it's just funny that as I've done this for 30 years and seen a lot of IBD, I, I, it's one of these topics that I feel like the more I see, the less I know, and that, um, and that classic cases like this seem to be the exception not, I mean, seem to be the, the uh, exception, not the rule. The rule is weird cases all the time, at least at our place. And I find it increasingly dis difficult to classify and separate Crohn's from UC. And I do start to wonder whether there's more than just these two diseases. But, you know, at this point, those are the only two we know. So who here gets biopsies or a series of biopsies? And then they write on the requisition, you know, CD versus UC. Do you ever, you know, you're asked in biopsies to separate Crohn's from ulcerative colitis. And we're going to talk about this. Most of this talk is actually focused on biopsies, but there's definitely some resection stuff. And the reason they want to separate Crohn's from UC, I mean, there's multiple reasons, but the big reason is because the best surgery for a patient with ulcerative colitis, if they have to have surgery, is an IPAA, an ileal pouch anal anastomotic procedure. It's a very common procedure. We do 